before we do hear her story, Councilman, uh, City Council Chairman, uh, Terrence Davis is gonna give us the welcome. Councilman Davis. Thank you. Yes, please come on in and have a seat. Um, I'm Councilman Terrence Davis. Um, I was reached out recently to a childhood friend of mine, Ms. Ms. Dove, it was Miller at the time. Um, and we talked about this opportunity of doing something to get this story in Riviera Beach. She doesn't live in Riviera Beach right now, but she travels back and forth um, quite a bit. Um, I thought about it, I said, well, there's a few organizations that I'm very, work dearly closely to, which is Bridges and Community Partnership. I think those mothers and fathers, those that choose to come, I would like to truly invite out um, to hear this story. I mean, I've lived some of this story with her, probably in the very beginning stages, and, and towards the middle, I ain't gonna say too much, I let her tell her own story. But I am not a statistic, relates to all of us in some form, and once you hear this story, and I wanna welcome you all to this occasion, so just sit back, relax, um, and hear this lovely lady when she's caught up at the time do. So thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Councilman Davis. And we're gonna hear a little bit more from him uh, a little later after um, our author speaks. Um, we're gonna go ahead and have a lunch. So we are going to call up who is a surprise guest um, uh, for our, um, for Ms. Dove, her fourth grade teacher, um, uh, Betty Corbett, who is, by the way, on page 22 in the book, she's talked about in the book, um, but she was her fourth grade teacher at Washington Elementary in West Palm Beach. And Ms. Dove did not know that Ms. Corbett was going to be here today, so that was really cool. And I hope we got the selfie of that when it happened. <laughs> but Ms. Corbett is going to give us the invocation this morning and say the blessing over the food. And she already indicated to me that she does not need a microphone. I Am Not a Statistic is a book about her life as a teenage mother, a young wife of an abusive, cheating husband, and a high school dropout who tried to end her life twice because she thought she'd made such a mess of it, and about her eventual restoration through her faith. She'll be able to fill in all the blanks, but today I want y'all to know that she is an accomplished educator. She's got a bachelor's degree in elementary education from Bethune-Cookman University, which she earned in 2003. She's got a master's degree from Nova Southeastern University and, ladies, a doctoral degree in ministry, which she earned last year. Those are the highlights, ladies and gentlemen. But in between is an extraordinary walk that, to me, recalls who we all are. I saw myself in some of the lines of this short, powerful book. I saw, for example, my young friend, Tyler Lawrence, who just got up to walk to the table. Tyler, turn around and say hello. <laughs> um, because she is on a similar walk as the young Miss Dove was, and she's working her way through. And I'm very proud of her. She, I don't know her super duper well, but I know that I see a lot of promise in her. And there's her little lady, Miss Skyler, who handed y'all some of y'all her books uh, earlier today. I also saw my own daughter, whose life is nowhere near as complicated, but it could have been had she made different choices. In other words, there but by the grace of God go I, really. And I'm so glad there's so many black women in here, you know, should I say race? But so many women in here, because I think her story is just so strong, and once you read it, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, but, you know, what I really like about the book is how simply it is written. It doesn't harp on those things that dragged her down. It tells what painful things happened, what poor decisions she made, yes, but the focus is on her spiritual journey and on the lessons that she learned and on those small things that happen to all of us every single day um, you know, along this path of life for good and bad. And she ties scripture to every single step that she took. It's very fulfilling, it's very enriching and very empowering. And it gives hope and direction and connectedness to the, one, to the one being that is always there, whether you realize it or not. And we all know who that is. Mother, Father, God, that's what I call him. So it's a great book written by an extraordinary woman who, by the way, grew up here in the great city of Riviera Beach. Um, she now teaches reading at the middle school level in the school district of Flagler County near Daytona Beach. She's the mother of three, and she's a licensed minister through Calvary Network International. 
But before I bring her up to tell her story, I want to tell you one other thing. Besides her noted accomplishments, which you will hear more about, she also beat thyroid cancer. The disease struck in 2010, and it has damaged her trachea and her vocal cords. So the sound of her voice is, is affected. And when I asked her about it yesterday, she struck the same tone that you'll read in her book. That, and I quote, this is what she said to me yesterday. The enemy tried to take my voice because he knew I had something to say. But he's not going to silence me, even if it meant putting it in a book instead. And guess what? That's exactly what she did. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jawanda Dove. But God, yes, but God, it is an honor and a privilege to be home in the great city of River Beach that I grew up in. Amen. I would like to thank Ms. Cobb, Ms. Thomas, and Councilman Davis, and all of you for joining me on today to hear my story, but it's all for his glory. It's all about someone that you may know, or it could be you. But with my life, I want to inspire and empower others to go from hopeless to extraordinary, because you are not a statistic. The title of my new book, I Am Not a Statistic, has resonated with so many women because we know that we are judged based on our past by society. Every year they create a report and we are put in a category with others who have been labeled as outcasts underachievers or failures. Does that sound familiar? They build prisons for us based on our elementary reading achievement scores. And they write us off as the lowest part of society. But my God, but whose report Will you believe? Will you believe the newspaper reports? Will you believe what that teacher said about you all those years ago? Would you believe what someone else said to you? My question to you on this morning, whose report will you believe? I often think of one young lady in particular. As a young child, she witnessed the effects of drug and alcohol abuse that ran through her family for generations. Gambling, arguing, police sirens, and visiting incarcerated relatives were the norm for her. She hated how she looked because of her dark skin and her short here. She was teased and mocked at school because of it. And she would often get in a few fist fights. This young lady eventually dropped out of high school and ended up having a child and getting married at 17. The world would have reported that she was a statistic, unworthy and damaged. But, my God, whose report will you believe? Today, this young lady is a wise woman who reared three children on her own. She has a thriving professional career, and she's a published author. She takes her message around the world 
to inspire and uplift young ladies who have been written off in the report of the world. But whose report do I believe? I believe the report of the Lord because I am that young lady. I am that wise woman. I am each of you sitting here right now who may feel you have been written off by the world, or perhaps you're sitting here and you know someone that feels like they've been written off by the world. But whose report will you believe? I believe the report of the Lord. God's report says you have a purpose and you will fulfill that God-ordained purpose no matter what. No matter what. You will fulfill that purpose. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Yes, I believe the report that says, I will bless you. I will bless you with a future filled with hope. A future filled with success and not suffering. Many days and nights, I was afraid and lonely. I felt abandoned and ashamed, but in spite of it, he brought me out. My message to you is to seek God and ask him to reveal his purpose for your life. God has called you for a purpose, and you will find happiness when you discover that purpose. You must overcome fear, failure, disappointments, heartbreak, guilt, and shame. And you must set goals for your life. And you must have dreams and dream big. Dream big. You serve a mighty God. Do what you love to do. Do what you're passionate about. Do what excites you. Why do you get up every morning? That's your purpose. That is your purpose. What you must do is walk in that purpose. Your purpose is not about you. It's not about you. It's bigger than you. The world needs to hear your story. Someone's life may be depending on your story. For example, the enemy, everything the enemy tried to use against me, I am now ministering to speak life into others. It hurt. It was painful. But my pain produced my purpose. And I will fulfill that purpose. My mess became my message. It's for his glory. The Bible says we overcome our enemy by the word of our testimony. Therefore, This book is a declaration of how my God has walked me through from the guilt and the shame of my past to empower 
and inspire others. God is 100% for your success. Everything the enemy tries to use to humiliate, discourage, taunt, mark, or bring shame will push you into your purpose. My pain and my daily needs cause me to seek God like never before. The pain caused me to walk into my purpose. The enemy meant it for evil, and he meant it for my destruction because he understood the call on my life, and he understood my kingdom assignment. Regardless of the plot of the enemy, distractions, delays, and trials of life, you must make a conscious decision to have faith in God no matter what. God is on your side. He's 100% on your side. Follow his plan and you will have good success. Everything I thought the world had to offer me, offer me, I had to give it up. And it hurt at the time. But again, my God, my God, whose report are you going to believe? Part of my assignment from here, from him, is to share what I've learned with others, to encourage and to empower them, not to become a statistic. Sometimes... I reflect over my life and the challenges I've survived. And I just dance and shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Glory, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. God has been so good to me. As a matter of fact, he's been beyond good to me. My being alive and in my right mind today is nothing short of a miracle. I don't care what anyone says. I am a success, not a statistic. If God can do it for me, he can do it for you. And on this day, in my closing, I want you to decree and declare, I am not a statistic. Thank you. Well, <laughs> you want me to tell the whole story? <laughs> okay. Well, I was really bad in class in school, and I was a troublemaker, and I would get into a lot of fights. And so, Miss Corbett knew that other 
teachers and the school would give me a hard time. So Miss Corbett took me under her wings to push me so I wouldn't beat anybody up in her class. So she would give me extra duties, pass out the paper, um, spelling bee, give me the speaking, you know, out speaking to show that that I was very bright and very smart. And Miss Corbett was a really professional, and Miss Corbett would come to class every day with her fishnet stockings. <laughs> and Ms. Corbett, <laughs> and, and a dress, and Miss Corbett said, you had to hold your pencil a certain way, you need to speak a certain way, finish your food at lunch, walk in line a certain way. And she was just, uh, stayed on me, but I would always listen. It was just something about Miss Corbett, and I knew she loved me, she loved her students, and she wanted us to be very successful. And Miss Corbett wasn't just concerned about my education, but she was concerned about my well-being and my life. And Miss Corbett said, and a couple of things I'll never forget that Miss Corbett said to me. She said, one, I was a fighter, and I like to fight. And Miss Corbett said, well, Lawanda Millen, let me tell you like this. It's better to be a live coward than a dead hero. <laughs> I think about that a lot now. I'd rather be a live coward than a dead hero. <laughs> and one of the things she said, because you know she's a, a rower, and I was in her fourth grade class, I always said I'm going to Bethune Cookman College, Wildcat for Life. And she said, when you go to Bethune Cookman, Mary McLeod Bethune is going to turn over in her grave. <laughs> But I love Miss Corbett. Speech, speech. <laughs> this is really a remarkable day for me. And I am so proud of her. And I am so proud to know that things that we did do in the past years as teachers, that they did rub off and make good citizens. So you have to put And we do hope that you will buy another book and give it to a child or another adult so that they can see what a wonderful, 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 wonderful woman this is. Anybody else? Any questions? I just, um, we have a lot of things to come, and I'm very impressed by you. Mm -hmm. But I want to know what continued, what happened to make you continue in your strive for excellence? Mm -hmm. I, we have a lot of people in common. Mm -hmm. We have the doctorate. But there are a lot of hills and valleys along the way. Absolutely. And I have to give my mom and a couple of other women, because women don't really support you like they should. Mm -hmm. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm actually proud to say that, because women should do a better job of supporting other women. Absolutely. But what was that guiding factor to help you get over those hurdles and those valleys I know the Lord was there, but I'm sure he placed some other people and some other things, because that's the Lord. He comes here through people, places and things. So I was just wondering if you could share a few other things that help you along the way that you know God sent there. It wasn't you, it wasn't anybody else, it was just him. My, um, my spiritual um, parents, my church, uh, my, my pastor, um, 
I was saved at 19 years old on Avenue S in Riviera Beach under a big gospel tent in Daisy Duke shorts. And the teaching, the ministry, my father, my, my father was always there to speak into my life and to encourage me. I still call, I still sit in my dad's lap now at 41. I'm a daddy's girl. And so my, my father and my faith, my children, looking at my children, looking into their eyes, I knew that I had to make a change in my life. I wanted my children to have the best that life had to offer. And I'm naturally a fighter. So I would fight through pain, through sickness, through trials, through having no money, being broke, busted, and disgusted, having no transportation to go to school, walking out at 11 o'clock at night from work after I worked a shift because that was that determination. And when you speak about women supporting each other, that was the purpose of I am not a statistic because I wanted to, I thought about everything that I went through. And I wanted to be able to pour into others to say, I've been there. I'm listening. I understand. I think I've experienced almost everything that you could possibly experience in life. And I've made it. Anybody else? Question? Well, you know, let, let me just take a minute before, before we call Councilman Davis up. There was this poem that's in this book that I was really struck by. Um, and if, you, if any of you, by the way, want to buy any more books to give to anyone, um, my friend right here has some. She can sell them. To, you know, she, she has them for you. But Miss um, Dove has this poem in the book, and I was really struck by it. She found it on the Internet. And it says... I am a 17-year-old black girl, so you know my story. I live on the poor side of town, so you know I'm ignorant. I have low standards and even lower self-esteem, so of course my boyfriend is in a gang. I am tatted and pierced because it's the trend. His initials, are on my thigh, my, his, his initials on my thigh are where it all begins. By now you know I'm pregnant and he says it's not his. I have to drop out of school to raise this kid. That's right, I am the statistic. But this is all a lie, a story that doesn't belong to me. I may be a young black girl, but there is more to my tale. Intelligent, inspiring, incandescent, you don't know me. Tough, tenacious, you can't scare me. I am not that girl, so don't compare me. Your misconceptions and preconceived perceptions, they are not me. They are lies, they are ignorant, and there are things I refuse to believe. I am not a statistic. And so I want to ask you, Ms. Dove, why did you put that poem in there? Why was that significant to you? It touched on so many areas of my life. And when you read my story, um, I dropped out of high school before I became pregnant. And I was attending Gold Coast Corporate Academy. And I, it just reminded me of my story. My husband was a neighborhood pharmaceutical representative And so you can uh, use your inferencing skills on that one. 
So he was a neighborhood pharmaceutical representative, and he was sentenced to a lengthy prison term. And, but I was always a bright, articulate, educated, honor student. And I had a lot to, to offer. I just got on the wrong path. I went, took some um, detours and went down the wrong path. And so I just wanted to, to let the world know that it's not, it's not about um, what you're going through, but it's who you are. Not your, whatever you're going through is not who you are. That's just something I went through. But I'm not that person. I'm smart. I'm educated. I know right from wrong. I know morals. That's why I was married at such a young age. I didn't want to. And my, my father and I, we talked about that. I did not want to have a child out of wedlock. Of course I wanted to be married and raise children with a, a husband, a father. So that's, that's why that was said. Anybody else? Any questions? Any comments to anybody before we call up Councilman Davis? No? All right, perfect. Thank you. And before I call up Councilman Davis, I think it's really interesting that, you know, even though she has a, you know, there was a part of her story that's really dramatic and painful, I find it really interesting that she doesn't focus on those things. She talks about what's positive and looking forward and going forward when maybe it's the storyteller in me, I want to hear all of the, well, what happened? Well, why did you do this? Well, why did you try to, but, you know, I think that's really good and that's positive and that's perfect. Absolutely. Okay, so... Councilman Davis is going to come up and um, help us uh, close down our big event. Before I get started, um, I just want to say thank you to the young man for coming out. Really do. I sent, I sent some stuff out. Um, her story is, wasn't just about motherhood. It's about fatherhood, too. Um, I can talk about, I was going to talk about some of the negatives for fun, because I grew up with her literally like five years old. My grandparents lived one block from her, her and her brothers and sisters. Um, we had some energetic times that we can say. Um, but listen to me. This young lady, once you read that book, um, there's no excuse for you not to succeed. And I'm going to say it again. If you read that book and stay in touch with this young lady, it's your fault after that. I've watched her go through some things when we were young children. Um, we might be lost contact at right about middle school. I think it was like seventh grade. You went to Watkins. I went to JFK Middle School, and I was happy not to see her again. Um, but you know, we 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 had I mean, in the neighborhood. You know, you you know, you may fight and play, but nobody else came to the neighborhood and messed with you. And we had that understanding. So around about 1996, which is maybe another eight years later, I was going through some tough times in life. You know, a lot of my friends were getting shot on Tamron. Uh, they were leaving Riviera Beach, going over to selling drugs, big drug war. Um, and then I found myself left with just one friend left. Um, and I didn't know what to do. You know, I know I wanted to go to college. I know I want to leave. I want to do so. I want to go to family, get in the bank. I want to do all this stuff. Had no money, no one to talk to about how to do this. So in 96, as it was going on, one day I was driving down Broadway. i never forget it. I was leaving McDonald's to get me something to eat. I have no clue where I was even going. And I see this young lady walking with her, I think she had scrubs on. Yeah, she had her scrubs on. And I'm like, nah, that can't be the same person. So I kept driving. I said, you know what, Terrence, turn around. So I turned around, and it was LaWanda. So I pulled over and said, get in the car. And she looked at me like, who are you? Because now I got a mustache, a beard, and all this other stuff. It was, you know, we were elementary school students the last time we saw each other. And then I told her who I was. She still didn't remember. Then I had to revert back to a motorcycle accident that she was a part of. That one of my uncles hit him with a motorcycle when we was kids. And then she was able to kind of tie the story back to who I was. And at the time, she, was, um, she had children. There was little ones. And she, at the time, when she talked about just now, she had no transportation. She was going to school. I think she was just getting off the bus. Were you transferring buses? You was walking. That's a long walk. Because 
because you was working in West Palm Beach at the time with children who were born HIV and AIDS. And I remember I got in the car and I gave her information. We talked on the phone. She talked about going to Palm Beach State College and eventually going to Bethune Cook University. I'm like, wow, that's cool. I knew I want to leave and I'm listening to her story. This is in 96. And spring of 96. And then over time, I would give her rides to work at night. If it was too late, she would call me as a last resort. She would never abuse that situation. If she really needed me, she would call me. Sometimes she would call me, could you bring me lunch? We, you, know, yeah, you know, I'm just that kind of dude. I'll look out for you if you're doing the right thing. And I would do it. And then maybe about six, seven months went by. Um, I had an opportunity to meet someone else that inspired me in my life to open up opportunity for me to, to um, go to college in California. Not knowing when I lost contact in 97, did, is that when you went to Cookman? Not knowing. We both left Riviera Beach and Palm Beach County at the same time, not even knowing it. And, and my, my drive started with that conversation with her, watching her with three children, correct? It was two. The boys <laughs> felt like three when I was playing with them. <laughs> she had the two boys. I would go to the house, we would play with the children. But at that time, she had two children working walking to work, walking to school. I'm like, man, she don't have no help, and she's doing it. So a guy gave me an opportunity to go out to California, and i never forget, and I got there. I met a gentleman by the name of Chris Roach, who's from Fort Lauderdale um, Dillard High School. And I'm like, man, I'm on the other side of the country. What the world am I doing? I had $125 in my pocket. And I always said I was never come home empty-handed, even if I had to be homeless. I ain't coming back here. And Chris Roach walked into me. It was 30 degrees. He had on shorts and flip-flops. He said, man, if you can survive the first year here, you can survive anywhere. And, and I thought about when I mean her, what she was going through. We never even talked about it to this level. I would have never ever thought that, you know, that one stop in that car ride would inspire me to, to take a chance and go to the other side of the country to even, to even foresee coming back here being an elected official to serve the community I serve in. These two, you know, this young lady, um, when you think about it, let me tell you something. God, and then we came back in contact, was it four years ago when I got elected? Right before I got elected on Facebook, and then, then that's when the cancer hit your throat. Then we had a conversation. We were talking, and all of a sudden, one day her voice was gone, and we back into a conversation all over again, you know, we just talking, talking through the process, and she kept talking about her book, her book. And then all of a sudden, I get into re-election, and her book is finished. And I told her, I said, I would love for you to make sure you come back to Riviera Beach. The Riviera Beach needs to hear your story. It is so powerful. And I had Walter, staff got Walter recorded because this is something that those who unfortunately could not be here today, they would get an opportunity to hear this on Channel 18 on local on cable channel. But um, I would definitely encourage everyone here, um, when you have some time at the end, to maybe share um, a few moments with Walter about your testimony, about what, what was your experience from today. He'll take about 15, 20 seconds from you. And just talk with her briefly. Do you mind? The, well, I know you're going to do that. She'll give you her information. She's just that type of person. But I just want to say thank you all for coming out. Lawanda, um, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, and it's powerful what you're doing. So we're both busy. <laughs> we still find a way to stay in touch. Um, I don't know what to say at this time. It is really good to be in the room to see people feeling what you're going through, what you went through, and be able to touch people. And I want you to keep telling people, keep telling people, because these little children, that were well, the one little ones, and there's some more children getting ready to be brought into the world, you're going to change their lives based on this experience through their parents. And I can really appreciate that. And thank you so much for coming back to Riviera Beach. And Ms. Corbett, we want to say thank you because if it weren't for you, they would not be a Lawanda today. Thank you so much. I remember because you used to, used to pop me too. <laughs> I wasn't even in the class. She used to pop me. I was just bad. I would run in the classroom just playing around chasing people, and, and she would pop you. But thank you, though, Ms. Corbett. You, 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 you've inspired all the people, all the little kids in T and S Avenue, Christina Webb, you know, which is my cousin, Lawanda, and we're really good friends, and all of us, we made it. And thank you so much. And to Ms. Gibson, thank you um, for what you're doing in your years of service teaching in the school district. Um, thank you, Ms. Makins, for coming out. And to all the mothers of Bridges and the young men, I want to say thank you all for coming out personally.
and all the guests whose names I do not know, I have to say thank you. All right? We, we have the mayor just walked in, Thomas Masters. Hey, mayor. But, but do anybody have one a question to ask Ms. Ms. Dove? At what time did the food start? Uh, they took it away. Too late? Okay. Yeah, they took it away. All right. I'll, I'll uh, it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I am so excited um, that you shared that, Ms. Dove. My name is Evangel Muhammad. I am with Regents of the Vera Beach. Um, I read a book a while ago. It was about the Rwanda genocide. And the question that always came up to me, how did that person find that endurance or strive to continue? And your message is that within the power of God, you find that and he give you that stamina to fight for something better and for the teachers that invested in you. I'm from South Africa and, you know, I was an ordinary young girl. I wasn't up to much church, but the educators would say that was mischief because you're not in compliance. If I say stay quiet, don't be too playful, don't you know be a clown, and that was basically my personality. I was a clown child, and everybody had a bad word about me on the street. But I was reared in a Christian home by one single parent, and I mean my mom was so strict. She was like head over uh, crazy dad. That was my crazy dad figure. And you know what, it, it was a tough childhood experience, but I can just say thank you. Because through it all, that you had people like the teachers that trusted in you, you had the neighbor that told you, you are that girl, you can achieve. And for our parents, you know, we have children, be that a, a, a person that, that stand behind your child and say, you can, I believe in you. If the teacher there don't believe in you, I believe in you. Share it with your neighbor's child. Be the parent to that neighbor's child and say, I do believe in you. I see you. Because what you have shared, your dad was there and I love that. Because a lot of our parents, where we come from, we don't have that father figures in our lives. Our children don't have that father figures. And you were fortunate to have that. You know, the dad in your life, he lifted you up and he kept you there. He said, my girl, you are that princess. You know, and I love that about your story, that you brought that dad out and, and shared with the public the importance of the father figure in the children's life. And uh, I had a father figure, which was my principal. It was so weird. I, I didn't like talking to the principal. I was like in 12th grade and he came to me on the playground. Don't sit on the cement. And I was like... What is it now? Because if you see the principal coming to you, everybody's like, what did she do? And I was like, just leave me alone, you know? I don't want to be branded. I, did, I didn't do anything. And he came to me and he said, I am so sorry. I didn't see you. I see you today. You are that girl that everybody is saying you are. I was, what, 16, 17? I was like, what is this man talking about? Just go about your way. But as I grew older, I realized the word about me on the street wasn't all that wonderful. I thought I'm maintaining my me, but it wasn't a beautiful me that the world saw. But when he and his adult capacity came to me and shared, I see you. You are a good girl. You know, and I made that flip of, you know what, if he see me being good, the others have something out there I didn't even know. But guess what? I need to do better. I need to do better and show the people this evangelism that this man is saying. And you know, from that point onward, I strive to be this wonderful princess girl that your father say you are. And today I'm here in America. I don't even know how I landed here. I never wanted to be in America. But I am here and I'm plugging into my community and I love it. You know, I love it and I love the people. It's like my own sisters and family. So thank you so much for blessing us with your story. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Gibson, I, I, I got to do a plug for her. She don't know this, but fam, I mean, Bethune-Cookman alumni need to keep her in mind when they need a guest speaker. 
Yes, I think it's very important. All right, all right. Thank you all for um, coming out. Ms. Um, Dove, you, you want to sign some books now? So if you want to bring your book, if you don't have a copy, just go over and just pick one up. So I purchased the first 50 copies for everybody here to at least get one. One copy, huh? Well, I was making sure that those came in late who maybe walked by. So you can come by, you can sign your autograph, sign autograph book. And you guys, as y'all get your signatures done, I just wanted to um, call Mayor Masters up if he doesn't mind. I just thought maybe you could come up and say a couple of things. As the leader of our wonderful city, Mr. Mayor, you got a couple of minutes, please, sir. And I think you know. I do. I do. Uh -oh. I do. Yes, of course. Uh -oh. uh, let me just say this. Oh. You ready? <laughs> If I can have your attention, if I can have everybody's attention, I'm grateful to be here. I, um, I can tell you that I have known Jawanda uh, 26 years. I knew her as a teenager. I think she was 17 when I uh, met her. Um, and she's a god sister, one of our members of our church even today. And I have seen her growth. I have seen her maturity. I have seen her spirituality. I, I have seen how... She has, you know, turned her life around. And not just a lot of people turn their lives around. But when you not just turn it around, but when you become productive and successful and give back to the community, uh, people are saved every day. But after you are saved, Jesus says, I want you to become fishers of men. Now, I don't want to just save you for you, but I want, you to, I want to save you for my glory and for the kingdom. And certainly, I can just tell you that uh, we love her. In this city, she's home born, grown, raised, reared, whatever we say. And we are always proud of, 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 of the work that she's doing. As a matter of fact, when she was getting ready to write one of her books, um, I was supposed to write something in there, forward or something I was supposed to do. I don't know if I've ever done it. But I'm here uh, today to share um, in this great um, um, a program. And I do hope that you get one. I think uh, Councilman Terrence Davis said he had purchased 50. Uh, that means I have to do the same because he's, he's my, uh, I call him my, my son up there, but he's more than that, he's my friend. And I'm a big supporter of Terrence Davis. Whatever he does, I'm going to likewise do. So I'll match it. Whatever he does, I'm going to match it because that's, as the young people say, that's how we roll. We, if we don't support one another, who else is going to support us so we must learn to support our community. I'm grateful, I'm thankful to be here and uh, to share with such a, a, a great young lady that I have known. And guess what? She's going to be my radio guest today. At, um, we tape at 4 o'clock, and you will be able to hear her uh, on 102.3 on Sunday morning at 6.30 a.m. Thanks to Marion, who's always, who's always um, set our guest up. And always on my team. Plus, she'll be heard around the world. So you heard her today, but Sunday morning, she'll be heard around the entire world. Give her another hand. <laughs>